Oh, we gaan hem eens voor hem toe met die ding. And can you use something as a pointer on the screen? Okay, so you use the arrows and... Okay, one sec, sorry. Right, um, good day everybody. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Richard. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone today. Um, speaking on a, on a post harvest symposium, since I've only had a very small time of um, dealing with the post harvest side. Um, so yeah, it's a, quite a challenge for me to speak here today, but I'll try and do my best. Um, I assume many of you know, and that's why you all sit here, is that the, the DCA and the, and the CA technologies um, offers a lot, lot of um, capability to us. Um, but both of those systems comes with a very complex relationship between the, the oxygen, the CO2, and temperature. And um, yeah, the, the part where we find ourselves in is the storage potential of what we put into those systems is um, greatly influenced by the maturity of the fruit that we put inside there. Um, and to make things a little bit more complicated, um, Elke started showing us that the fruit on the outside also differs in its maturity from the fruit on the inside. And it also goes for, for different canopy positions that we say you see the same differences. And with these differences and the complex um, interactions of the relationships we see, we also find in increases in different types of uh, risks we find with the physiological dis disorders. And yeah, to make it even a little bit more complicated, we also see that if you have uh, variations in fruit structure or fruit size, it also influences the partial pressure, not just in the room, but inside the fruit of these, um, the, the, the gases that we use to control the, the maturity in the, in the rooms. So my um, observations in the past two or three seasons have come to some conclusions on if this is a very complex system, how can we make it a little bit less complicated to ourselves by reducing the variation of what we put inside the rooms? And to reduce that, we need to start looking at, at the orchards in which we um, produce the fruit to make it a little bit easier for ourselves because this becomes a really complicated puzzle um, like Prof Torres showed in the beginning, she had the three circles and the one was the orchard side which has a lot of little circles around it, um, which represented the, the cropping systems that, that we use. So, yeah, like in the pre previous season, we also saw the, we keep track of the cold units and the heat units, and especially for the, for the serious area, we plainly put it on a graph to compare to, pre to the last 20 to, uh, or to the last 10 seasons. And for us, it was quite clear if we look at the, the, the release date that there would be a shift in maturity. But that's not really something that we can control, um, even though we knew it and we saw it with the early varieties and the early stone fruit and, and cherries. But that wasn't my main concern. My main concern was what we are producing. So coming back to the variation that we create is the first slide that I want to show is we need to go back to, if we want to reduce the variation of what we produce, we have to start at the canopy structure. So before we look at the variation in an orchard, let's just look at what we produce on each tree. And be critical enough to say, what is the light distribution within each tree really tell us? And if this is the picture that you are looking at, at this time of the season where you still see fruit hanging, I think the, ops the, the answer is quite clear that you did not optimize your tree production system. You had too much shading on the leaves, too much shading on the inner canopy, and we know that the leaves that's closest to the fruit is the most important to determine the quality of that fruit. Even though some summer pruning can re relieve this in a later part of the season, it's like um, cumulative interest on an investment that you've lost 
already in early part of the season. So the question comes back to, do we really need all these branches? And if we look critical at the number of branches per running meter of the tree, and the, the long and overlapping bearing units, um, do we really need all of this to produce good quality fruit? And if we come to a situation where we say we want to produce quality fruit with optimum maturity and less variability, we need to be able to, to look at inner and outer canopy and the top and, and the bottom of the tree to say that we actually produce the same quality of fruit on all of those different positions. So if we look at crop load, where we say that we crop the tree to its optimum position, let's just look what happens if we overcrop. If you overcrop, your color development is delayed. Lucky I'm not a scientist, so I don't have to show you any stats of this. Um, I can just say it. Um, and you can go and look it up elsewhere. Um, but if you overcrop, we know that color development is delayed. Um, if you delay your color development, you're more likely to pick at advanced maturity. Um, and in this case, you would decrease your storage potential of the fruit, increase your risk of fruit going soft, increase your disorders of lenticels, um, internal browning, breakdown, the list goes on. Um, <laughs> But on a production side, it also requires more labor input. So you would probably need more picks um, to go through the orchard. And each time you start harvesting fruit, you will also increase your risk of um, uh, handling errors like bruising and fruit drop. Um, and it's not like we really need any more bruising um, at this stage of the fight. So, on the downside is if you overcrop, you also have a risk of return bloom issues in the next season. So if you have issues with return bloom, you end up with more variation in your orchard and on your tree, and the cycle just gets worse. If you have a lower crop than you are supposed to, you end up with more vigor and competition close to your fruit. You end up with a larger size fruit. Um, which then increases your risk of bitter pit, lengthy cell, bigger fruit, softer fruit, to reduce storage time, and breakdown. So the cycle goes on and on. So I think a lot of the orchard factors can be explained by just evaluating the tree on what we produce the fruit in terms of what we can expect. Um, I think sometimes we overcomplicate things and we already know the answer, but we try and complicate it for ourselves, and we are not really honest when it comes to the fruit that we produce and put into storage. Not that uh, there doesn't happen some issues in post-harvest. Um, I don't want to <laughs> exclude that completely. Um, it sometimes gets difficult. Um, but I think the, the real change that we should make is in terms of, of what we produce. Um, we used to grow trees and then we hang fruit on them. And the change that we need to make is to say, what, what's the end product that, that we want to produce? And then we grow the tree according to that. And we put the fruit in the correct positions and not the other way around. Um, when I started just after my um, uh, studies, I know one of the, the, the growers commented, yeah, the ground is deep and the ligt is verniet. So they grow really big trees, and yeah, that was just the, the trend. I think we've come a long way since then. So what does the optimum tree structure really look like? If we look at, look at this picture over here, we can see that we have all the spaces between the branches, and every branch really has the potential to get the same amount of light on it. We can good, get good spur leaves and cluster leaves development from the inside of the canopy to the outside. And we can see, based on this, even on, on older trees and older structures, that you can get the same quality of flowers from the inside to the outside. And this is at the bottom of the tree, and you can see that the top of the tree is in the same flowering time as the, as the bottom of the tree. So by just reducing the, the canopy and the canopy structure and making it less complicated, we can already end up with a product that looks like this in a bin, where we can see um, uh, a great uniformity in color and size of what we've produced. So it already makes things 
less um, complicated. Again, if we, put, if we have a practice of pruning and tree training where we use fruit on the same quality of wood and the same age, and we really try our best to reduce the variability of what we start with, um, it can also reduce the variability of what we end with, even with bicolors, to have less peaks and more uniform size and maturity. Um, so it al already um, sets things less complicated. Also, on a branch like this, you can see full bloom is very clearly over here and in the orchard, so it might just makes things less complicated. Let's look at bitter pit, which was already mentioned for the um, last situation, or for the past season. First of all, I would like to compare two blocks, block one and two, um, new names for now, um, but both of them cropped um, fairly good. You can see if you look at the, the tons per hectare produced, we had 96 tons and 91 tons per hectare produced. However, one of these blocks had 32% of bitter pit, um, and this was in um, forced or hot, hot room shelf life temperatures that we evaluated, so 5% is really pushing it to the limit. Um, so I would consider this um, really like a normal season with almost no bitter pit, but compared to that, we can see a big problem. So the first thing that I, if I look back and say, well, you should have uniform ca canopies and good cropping potential within your orchard. Both these guys said, well, um, it was a good crop. Um, I almost produced um, 90 or 100 tons on, on the block. Well, yes and no. You did produce 100 tons, but if we look at our ideal, this comes from, from a history of what we wa really want to produce on, on gold ends. We have a, a gold fruit weight, which is around about on, um, 150 grams, and this gives us a fru uh, ideal fruit size distribution of about 40% smalls, so which would be between 55 and uh, 66 millimeters, then 50% mediums and 10% large. If you look at block one, we had a fairly significant portion more of the, of the large fruit, um, which resu also resulted in the fruit mass being um, relatively higher compared to what we would have expected for an orchard like this. The issue now is if you go and look at a tree and the canopy and we say we need balance between vigor and cropping, instead of undercropping or overcropping, if we look at a, this orchard, we say, when we did our calculations, we required more or less um, 400 fruit, because these two orchards both produce more or less uh, um, 100 tons. So working on the, the gold fruit weight, we required actually 400 fruit. Um, that was the, the required amount, sorry. Um, the actual amount of what we produced was only 300 fruit came from this tree but what made up the yield was the, the larger fruit size. In reality, we actually had a quarter of the sites not bearing fruit. So the, the balance with, within this canopy was um, really disturbed. So we ended up with some portions of the tree being optimally cropped and some portions undercropped. This resulted in some very large fruit on empty branches um, and definitely more generations of fruit. When we evaluated this um, in, in, in terms of size distribution, you can see block one had a fairly norm, normal distribution of the, of the um, fruit size, whereas the, the second block, which had the larger split between small, medium, and large, actually had four generations of fruit on those trees. It was quite clear when we started doing the analysis that we can see that the, the empty branches with a, which had more competition right next to it gave the bigger fruit and that resulted in the bitter pit. So the bitter pit didn't come from a block thing, it didn't come from a, um, a tree thing, it actually came from just producing bitter pit on specific branches and we could see that branch, those branches with the big fruit on them. Also, the, the clusters with the bigger fruit tended to push each other off closer to harvest and when you stood in the block you can hear the fruit drop and that also resulted in, in a lot of bruising um, on the fruit. So 
where we had a fairly clean harvest. You can see we didn't really have a lot of other defects. The export post portion of this block was um, uh, reduced by just looking at, at what we actually produced. I just want to make a comment on fruit drops since it's something that's um, <laughs> bothering me a, much, a lot. So I'm not speaking about physiological disorders, but I still see bruising as one of our biggest culling factors. Um, so while I get the chance, let me have this one. So the large fruits in the clusters, if we look at push-offs, we can see um, big bruises already in the, in the QC form. 27% uh, of what we put in the, the bin and small bruises 10%. So a lot of times we would go to the pickers and say, listen here boys, you need to stop your, um, uh, you, you need to look at the way that you're picking. But this wasn't actually a picker mistake. We can already attribute that to, to fruit drop and if you strip pick a, a tree in the orchard, you can see that. So 44% of the, what we put in the bin was only export, exportable due to bruising and fruit drop. Um, again, goes for, for pink ladies. We sometimes do a lot of things correct, and then we don't look at this, and it creates a lot of injuries. I don't know if it's visible from the back, but we create a lot of injuries on nice fruit. So, just want to get my stab in there. Let's look at something closer to home, which is water core. Um, might not be a big problem for everybody, but it's something that we definitely pick up. Um, again, water core, when we do evaluations of, of orchards um, during harvesting time, we can see that crop load and fruit size are mainly the two things that, that influence the, the appearance of water core. And we know it's an issue on red apples and fujis, specifically in our region, but even on grannies and crips red. It's also influenced by the harvesting window, um, increasing as, the, um, as the, the, the maturity increases and also temperature during the time of harvest. We know that those um, sunny days with the cold nights um, can really reduce respiration close to harvest and that, gives, that also increases the water core. Well, the bad side of it is there's really, the clients are really becoming very um, specific in the specs of what they would accept in terms of water core. So we try to reduce it when we harvest the fruit. We, we try to keep it in a little bit higher temperature um, but also, it comes with its risk of internal um, disorders, reduced storage, and loss of firmness. And in a case like this, also the weakest link determines the strength of the chain. So if you have some fruit, fruit with water core, you have to treat the whole package um, a little bit different, and you lose out on a lot of opportunities. So just to have a look at some of the water core with, that we do get on red apples and fujis in our area is it gets really extreme. But again, if you look at what's in the package over here, we can see that the crop load and the size is really the difference. And we can identify these orchards even before we start harvesting. We can point out the risk of water core in these orchards and we get fairly accurate in the way by just looking at the, the previous comments that I've made. Yeah, and when it starts like this, it normally ends something like this. When you do keep the fruit too long and um, you don't get the water core out of the fruit. We do see some senescence and, and browning inside. So, yes. But again, looking at this, you can see it's probably the bigger fruit that normally gives you the stuff. So it's again the fruit balance of fruit close to um, leaves and getting that balance right, which will reduce your risk of disorders. Right, so let's say we want to produce some pink ladies. We know we have to harvest them at an at a optimum maturity to reduce the risk of internal browning. We know we have the issues with the inside and the outside fruit being different. What can we do? Um, we start off by saying we need to produce fruit on good quality buds, um, which I've made my statement already. We have to get an even light distribution within the tree, set the correct crop load, which I'm going to elaborate now on a little bit. Um, but that should be made on each branch. And finally, when we have that correct, we can look at the orchard as a whole and say, listen here, within my orchard, how do I further then correct for the variances within my orchard? And I think that's the final step of it. And hopefully, if we do all of this correct, um, we will reduce our risk of, of physiological disorders. So when I started working for the toy, 
um, I found these little circles inside some of the thinner's bags um, while they were thinning and I tried to figure this thing out and after about two years I threw it away because I couldn't really figure it out. Um, in that, at that stage we had a lot of older trees with more permanent branches and more thicker branches and the more you try to calibrate this thing, um, the more we adapted to what we need the answer to be instead of looking what the answer should be and adapting the tree. Um, and that's why we, I never could really figure this thing out. So what this tells you is for each branch diameter, there's an allocated um, number of fruit that should be there per square centimeter. And that you can, there's some changes that you can make based on the, the caliper of this. This obviously needs to be optimized for different growing conditions, but I think we've, we've started with the process already and the light really went on for me. That if you get this correct, this can be an orchard on a MM109 rootstock. And if you crop each branch to its potential, you can get a, a very good balance of vigor and crop. And you can get a very nice and calm canopy with sunlight penetrating to all the leaves and reducing the variability again of what you produce. But this little tool over here, I think is a little bit under evaluated for our industry and we need to have a little bit more of a look at it. The second part of it is having a plan of what you want to produce. I've mentioned the part of the Goldens where we have a um, ideal fruit weight and every season we look at this and we look at what we've produced in terms of small, medium and large and we have a, a gold fruit weight and we have a uh, what we've actually produced and we reevaluate this situation to make sure that we get this correct. And if you look at the, the medium sizes, which is 66 to 75 millimeters, you can see that a fairly large percentage of the fruit for most of the varieties, between 50 and I would say 60% falls within the medium. So it's a very small range of what we want to produce. And I challenge you guys to go back and look at what you produce in terms of that to make sure that you get to that instead of getting to the golden situation where you produce um, a large variation within different fruit sizes. Then again, coming back to the pink lady, if we can get to the, that um, correct orchard positions and, and canopies, we would have a more uniform crop. This is golden delicious. Please forget, forgive those two crazy fruits. But in general, if you look at the population of this, you would see there's a, there's a fairly um, good distribution of maturity within this. You can see the sizes is more or less uniform, and you would expect a lot less issues with fruit like this. The same goes for, for some of the other fruits, where you have a good penetration of light to the inside of the canopy, and even the, out, the inside fruit colors the same time as the outside fruit with less peaks. Now, this is um, two different situations as well. Um, on the right hand side, we also have a rosy glow orchard. You can see a lot of vigor on the, on the top side of the trees, um, which has already been picked in the first two picks. And then this remained on the tree. Sorry, it's a little bit dark, but it was late in the afternoon when the picture was taken. Um, I hope you guys at the back can follow this. But this is leaf removal done to um, to get the fruit to color. But like we've mentioned in the beginning of it, the spur leaves and everything and the nutrient balances and everything in the inside canopy fruit should be the same as the outside canopy fruit. And um, Ken Breen spoke to me in New Zealand and he said this is well, this is like putting lipstick on a pig. Um, so you can either <laughs> choose to have a situation like this where you have good color on the inside of the canopy because of light distribution or you go, can go to this situation and see what the outcome would be. In the past season, I also looked at what we produced in terms of golden delicious, and I looked at fruit dry mass per percentage. So for a number of orchards ranked from smallest to largest, I've just plotted down the fruit dry mass of what we produced. And you can see of some of the orchards where we overcropped and we didn't have enough light, we had fairly 10.5% of fruit dry mass. And in some of the other orchards, um, you can see there's a, there's a 
at the higher end, there's about 60% more fruit, fruit dry mass in what we produced. So again, we would expect less issues from that compared to this. And on the statement that um, Dr. Torres also made is to say that there's some variability in the incidence of um, maturity indexes. I would guarantee you if you analyze this in a lab, it will give you different results in terms of acidity and starch conversions based on, compared to that. And again, I think um, we need to look at what we produce and have more measurements to say what the actual quality can be. The same goes for, for doing um, some mineral analysis. In the past season, we've done some um, peel sap mineral analysis on Golden Delicious, and this is just a list of orchards um, where we analyzed it. And if I put them in a ranking, this, sorry, I didn't put the labels on the axis, but this will be the, um, the potassium to calcium ratio done at a very early stage. We can see if you put, a, put the orchards in a list over here, there's a great variation of in, in um, the different orchards. And this speaks for itself. And we know by the previous season's history, and I've dotted some bitter pit incidences on there, that these orchards gave us problems. But it was already detectable at a very early stage in, in that. So um, the same culprits came to, to the front again. Um, so it was already in, early in the season, it was quite clear that um, what we could expect from them. <coughs> So how do I solve all of this, since I'm not a post-harvest physiologist, is we've built in a little bit of a matrix for us and each orchard we visit before we harvest it. So literally we go to each and every orchard before we put it into storage. Um, so we go with the soil scientists and the horticulturist and the production team. Um, and we evaluate this in terms of long, medium and short. And we give it basically a score, a one, two and a three. And for each one of these things, we have, we've set out a little bit of a parameter in terms of soil factors, sandy versus loam, pH, calcium base saturation. We look at the minerals in the leaves, um, specifically nitrogen and potassium. We also look at the fruit mineral analysis. Um, and then we judge the vigor on the trees to say, what's the general vigor like? Is it high, low, or more or less balanced? Also, what's the, the difference in vigor between the top and the bottom? Is it balanced, although we have a big variance in the vigor? And we evaluate crop load. We look at the, the general crop, the top versus the bottom, the variation within fruit size. Is there a, a high variation, medium variation, and low variation? And we also then lastly, like I mentioned, we look at the, what's the variation within the orchards. And based on this, we give a, a, a score for, for each one of the orchards. And we basically determine what's the risk for it. And based on that, we decide whether it goes long, medium, and short. But that's done all before we put it into storage. Just to show that there are some variations within the orchards, and we are now able to measure this more accurately with um, some, some camera technology as well, where we drive through the orchards. But when we do the analysis, we can see this is a one specific block, and that's another one. We can go to different irrigation taps. And when we analyze it as well, we see that there's differences in terms of minerals content in the, in the fruit as well. So based on this, we can also say that um, we would either allocate this to a different allocation, these tabs, or handle the block as a whole um, as a different, instead of just grouping them together, putting in the, in the cold storage and, and um, yeah, expecting this, the same results from it. Lastly, this is the last part of what we do. Um, we've got a system where we say we've got harvesting windows for, for long, medium, um, RA, medium and short, short term, and, and RA. And we've resulted in a very simple system, whether it's a bicolor or, or a um, golden delicious or red delicious, something that you only pick once. We've resulted in a very simple system to say once we've um, set a release date, for us, after we've allocated the, the potential of the orchard, we now have to harvest it at the optimum maturity. So we first looked at the variation, then we decide on what the maturity should be. And on, only now we will say, if, it's, if a specific orchard had the potential to be um, allocated to, to long term, 
it needs to be harvested within that first picking window. Otherwise, it by default go to medium term and so on and so on. And after that, we will look at what the maturity is within it and we will look at the, the, um, all the fancy ethylenes and the gas, gases and the lower limits of what was set in the DCA. And based on that, we will decide what's the really storage, storage potential of the fruit. Just to conclude, if we look at something like this, sorry, Richard, one more minute. If we look at something like this, this is all our red delicious. Um, and we've allocated this. Um, you can see the different um, picking windows that we harvested it in, the number of pins for each room. Um, and this is the orchard allocation. Whether it was picked in the right maturity, this orchard was already allocated this room. There was already orchard factors that determined the maximum storage potential of it, not the, only the maturity at the beginning. Lastly, to the producers, I want to say, um, please don't try and make special requests with your orchard when it's being delivered to the pack house. It's really difficult to unpuzzle your orchard afterwards. We sometimes end up with more than um, 12 different orchards within one storage room, and it's scattered, that one orchard scattered over potentially seven or eight other different rooms. It's difficult enough to have one or two plants, so in this case you are lucky. In this case you won't be so lucky. It's difficult to have one or two different plants. If everybody comes with a special request for their fruit, you have 12 different plants to adhere to. Yeah. And yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, my